Good morning. I am Brooke Lament, director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, and it is my pleasure to welcome you this morning. Uh, first things first, please join me in thanking the Gerald R. Ford Foundation for their support for this exhibit and program. This morning, we are joined by a panel of historians who will be discussing second families. If the vice presidency is considered a thankless job, what does that say for the families that support them? It wasn't until 1978 that federal statute was even modified to extend budgetary support to the second spouse. And not until the 1980s did the second spouse have an office at the executive office building. Mrs. Ford wrote in her memoir that before her husband became vice president, she had planned on volunteering at a hospital to do something for someone else. Upon becoming second lady, though, she had more projects than she could handle. Uh, modern second spouses have traveled on official visits, championed causes ranging from the arts, mental health, and literacy. And with all of this, the last few second spouses have continued to work in their respective fields. So to help us delve deeper into these second spouses and their families, I am happy to introduce our panel this morning. Our moderator is Dr. Robert Hendershot, Professor of History in the Department of Social Sciences at Grand Rapids Community College. He specializes in the historical influence of culture, identity, and public opinion on British-US rela relations. Joining him are Dr. Lindsay Travinsky and Dr. Kurt Graham. Dr. Travinsky is a senior fellow at the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University and is the author of The Cabinet, George Washington, and the Creation of an American Institution. She was co-editor of Mourning the President's Loss and Legacy in American Culture and is working on a book on John Adams. My colleague, Kurt Graham, rounds out this panel. Dr. Graham is the director of the Harry S. Truman Presidential Library Museum. Prior to this, he directed the McCracken Research Library at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, where he launched the papers of William F. Cody. He previously was a member of the history faculty at California State University in San Bernardino, where he taught courses in American political and constitutional history. Please join me in welcoming these panel participants to the Ford Museum. Thank you very much, Director Clement. Uh, yes, I'm Bob Hendershot. I'll be your humble moderator for this <laughs> panel experience this morning. And I wanted to begin by giving our, our, our two experts here a few minutes to uh, begin with some opening remarks on the roles and responsibilities of vice presidential families and sort of the long durée of US history. And, and to ask them for their thoughts on what are the most significant factors that have caused the, the roles to evolve? Uh, what has brought about significant changes in vice presidential families and their relationship with the state and with the, with the, with the public over time. Um, so yes, uh, let, may we begin with you, Dr. Javinsky? Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you all for being here and thank you so much to the, the Ford Library and the Foundation for having us. It's, it's a real treat and I think uh, in the last couple of decades, we've really seen the importance of the vice president increase and become a part of our national conversation and so I'm so glad we have an opportunity to convene to delve a little bit deeper into perhaps the 30 second sound bites that we sometimes see on television. Um, so I, I really appreciate, especially the conversation that happened last night um, when Joel was giving his opening keynote, he talked a little bit about the start of the vice presidency and the peculiarities in the constitution and the requiring 12th amendment to make it a little bit clearer. And so I thought with my opening remarks today, I would take us back into previous centuries and look a little bit at the first couple of presidents and vice presidents because so much of the constitutional system that we have is unwritten. It was evolving and very much under construction for the first several decades. And the participants, the actions of those in, in power or married to those in power very much shaped what happened for the next 150 years. So um, of course the vice president did exist before the 1950s and so we will, we will start there. So the first vice president of course was John Adams and Abigail Adams was his better half, which I think he would agree with that uh, description. At the very beginning of the early republic, there was this thing called the Republican Court 
which were a series of families that surrounded the president and the vice president and other members of Congress and the Supreme Court. And they sort of formed the elite social world, first in New York City and then in Philadelphia. Martha Washington always had her drawing rooms, which were her social event on Friday evenings. She served tea and lemonade, uh, no alcohol, and there was to be no gambling at these events. Um, but then other women had other nights that they sort of claimed as theirs, and Abigail Adams had one as well. Now, it was a really interesting comparison because Martha, of course, was from a very wealthy family in Virginia. Abigail was from a much more modest, humble family from Massachusetts. And I think there are still cultural differences between Massachusetts and the South today, but they were very much so at that time. And so depending on whose house you went to on any given night, the social scenes would look a little bit different, the culture would be a little bit different. But these should not be confused as purely social spaces or interactions. These arrangements were essential to politicking, they were essential to networking, they were essential to uh, people filling positions and candidates meeting the right power brokers, and the wives were very much the power brokers behind those scenes. So Abigail helped certain people, either in her family, in, in her friend circle, people she knew obtain positions, obtain the right connections to get those positions, and that was a regularly accepted part of the political scene. Moving forward to John Adams' administration, Thomas Jefferson at this point, um, his wife had died many years prior, and he didn't really want to be in Philadelphia if he could help it. So none of his family, none of his daughters lived with him, and he fled as soon as he had every single opportunity whenever Congress would finish its session. But the second lady really came in to her own when Thomas Jefferson was president, because again, he did not have a spouse. His daughters were married, they had their own families, and while they did come to the White House, to try and help him sometimes, Dolly Madison was really the hostess of Washington, D.C., and she was James Madison's wife. She was, by all accounts, the most charming person that anyone had ever met. Like, no one disliked Dolly. And they also always felt better about themselves when they left, which is a real skill. So she was an essential part of crafting the early Washington, D.C. community, and then she continued to excel at that as first lady. And I think these three examples, and we'll delve into some of the other early ones in, in the course of our conversations because there are some very colorful stories I'm looking forward to sharing with you. But I think these three examples get at three elements of the vice presidency, which came forward in very sharp distinction in the early republic, and then explain why we almost don't know anything about the second families for like the next 100 years. There is a lack of constitutional obligation for the vice presidency. In a lot of ways, it is an afterthought. They have to have a pulse, is mostly their job duty on any given day. If it is a close Congress, then they have to break ties, but that was a relatively rare historical occurrence. We see it a lot today. It did not happen a lot in the past. So if there's no legal thing they have to do, then is there some sort of other expectation? The vice presidential salary was quite low at the time. They did not have an official residence, as we've heard, until I think the first president who actually lived in the Naval Observatory was Walter Mondale, so this was a relatively recent occurrence. So if they didn't have a whole lot of money and they didn't have an official residence, most vice presidents lived by themselves out of a hotel room or in a boarding house in Washington, D.C. for most of American history. So. There's no constitutional obligation. There's no real space for them to have a social contribution. And lastly, as we heard last night, for those of you who are able to join us, most vice presidents are selected or were selected based on their electoral benefits. Did they balance out a ticket? Did they add some sort of electoral college heft to what uh, was already in place with the president? They weren't considered a governing partner. They weren't considered an advisor. That goes all the way back to George Washington when he did not invite John Adams to a single cabinet meeting, not one. Um, and so there's no unofficial governing expectation. So if you don't have a legal reason to be in DC, you have no place to be in DC, and you have no unofficial reason to be there, there's a whole lot of expectation that the vice president is kind of useless. Mm -hmm. 
And um, that was, I think, once that really sort of crystallized around the Civil War for, I would say, almost the next 100 years. So those three factors, I think, are really um, come, come to play in the first couple of decades, cr are crystallized, and then, of course, we see a big change. So I'm looking forward to talking about that process, how it, how it does change, uh, and why it changes in the 20th century, and what we can take from that today. Thank you very much. Dr. Graham. Well, thank you very much. I want to start <clears throat> by, and that's fascinating. I can't wait to hear more about those three points as well. I was taking some notes myself. That sounds wonderful. Um, I, I want to thank Brooke and Joel and Gleaves for pulling this together. First of all, it represents, um, I think, the power of the public-private partnership that is so critical to these kinds of, this kind of understanding, this level of education, um, to inform the public about this, these important offices that we represent. And uh, it, it is something that we can't um, necessarily take for granted. I, I have a wonderful relationship with the foundation. I perceive that the same is true here. And that really is, I think, the future of the presidential library system. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that and, and very honored to be invited here. I'm also thrilled because I've long felt that the vice presidency is an office that we ignore far too much, both in our history and, frankly, even, even now, you think about the role of the vice president. And I'm, I'm just thinking about recently how everybody was wondering, does Mike Pence have the opportunity to say who the electors are, you know, like sort of change the outcome of the election? And there were all these arguments. People go back and, well, let's look at the Constitution. Let's look at the Federalist. You know, let's look at all these systems and, and things that are in place. And the people, what's interesting about it is we've ceased to have constitutional arguments around these important issues. Because the people who argued that Mike Pence should have that opportunity would certainly not argue that Kamala Harris now has that opportunity. I mean, so the, the, the arguments that we make are very much convenient. And, and, and the opposite is true as well. I'm not calling out any particular side other than to say that, that we aren't looking at this from a constitutional or even sometimes even logical um, perspective. So I think it, there's, there's a critical role that the vice president is coming to play. And, and as these things come up, we're all of a sudden looking around the room asking questions like, well, can they do this or not? And, and I think it underscores the point that we have ignored this office for far too long and ignored it potentially at our peril. Um, you know, the, the issue of, of, of electoral balance, of, of having people from different states, and, and uh, Lindsay referred to that. But I think today, does anybody really care or even really know in, in any meaningful way what state the vice president comes from? It has less to do now with the state they're from than with their particular role within the party. So do we need to shore up the base? Do we need to maybe show a little more moderation? Do we need to, and so we, we pick someone, the presidents pick people based on their ability to help electability for sure. But, but that role is different than what state anyone's from. We don't think geographically, we think tribally. And I think that's why that, that role um, is, is, is changing and is, is important. Evidence that we have ignored this office for so long is that, and I'll, I'll go to the Truman era, which is the legacy I represent. When Harry Truman became president in 1945, at the death of Franklin Roosevelt, April 12, 1945, what was interesting about that is he served out the rest of that term uh, all but 82 days of, of Roosevelt's fourth term. So he's, he serves a full term, basically, without a vice president. There is no mechanism for backfilling the role of vice president. No, uh, and it didn't seem to be a crisis. It didn't seem to be anything anybody worried about. The Speaker of the House is the next in line. There was a speaker always. But the vice president wasn't there until he runs in 1948 and wins, and Senator Barkley becomes Vice President Barkley. Um, but again, how many people today, even among scholars, how many people know who Alvin Barkley even was? And, and how many people could name the vice presidents of the 19th century? You think about, you know, who was Chester Arthur's vice president? I'll be honest, I have no idea. But, but the point is, it's just, it, it's, those folks faded in the same way that, I mean, there were, there were speakers, Speaker of the House, other, other people 
who had a far more prominent role. There were secretaries of state. In fact, interestingly, we look at the vice presidency today as the stepping stone for, for people to get in, to, to be at the top of the ticket. That wasn't necessarily always the case. There were, there were more secretaries of state early on who became, who became presidents. That was the more logical route to become the president. So it, it is an office that has evolved. It is one that has come really from obscurity, and there are all kinds of, I won't bore you with vice presidential jokes, but there are all kinds of stories and funny little quips about how useless that office is. And yet today, and I think that um, we're going to get into this, the, the availability of communication, the, our ability to know about these families, about these individuals, and about the things that they do, you know, through social media, through just the, the mass media, we know their names, we know their faces, we see them all the time. So someone like, you know, Lynn Cheney or Tipper Gore occupied a very different cultural place than did, you know, the wife of, you know, Van Buren or so, some, someone like that. I mean, there's just, th those, those, those people are lost to history. And think about it. We know our first ladies. We love our first ladies. Um, Kate's written some great books about the first ladies. But nobody, you know, there's, there's no gallery full of second ladies' gowns. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no such thing. Nobody, nobody pays attention to who these people were. And, the, and their children, whether they were controversial, whether they were ne'er-do-wells, whether they were an embarrassment to their family, didn't, didn't have a political, I mean, for the most part. That starts to change, obviously, in our time because, because we live in a reality TV era. We live in, in, in a sort of cult of celebrity, cult of personality. And I think that changes the role of these families. But, um, but I, I, I do think it's important to realize, and, and I'm eager to learn more from my distinguished colleagues here, about that evolution. Because I, I will say again, I think we ignore this important constitutional office at our peril. And I think we need to know a lot more about it, about its roles, responsibilities, about its limits, and about the nature of the sacrifice that it takes to uh, be in that position. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think it's fascinating to think about the intersection of what we can think of as political celebrity and, as you said, a very important constitutional office. And in terms of vice presidential families and their relationship with their public roles, in the United States, in its history, is our modern concept of celebrity developed. A lot of books have been written about how this emerged largely in the 1920s along the rise of mass media communications in radio mm -hmm. and, and with the rise of Hollywood talkies and so on. And I, I'm curious, you know, like did that American cult of celebrity, as we understand the concept from the 1920s on, did that shape the experience of vice presidential families? Um, or was it, can we take it further back? You know, uh, Dr. Chavinsky, was there a concept of political celebrity at work uh, in, in, in American politics in the early republic, for example? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, one, one quick tangent before I answer your question. So Chester Arthur, to your point, had no vice president because he had, ass he had assumed the office uh, after the death of a president just like, yeah. and there was no mechanism to fill it in. And actually, highly recommend go on Wikipedia and look at the list of vice presidents. The amount of times that we have gaps is astounding. Yeah. And it's one thing when it's, you know, sort of like the 1940s and we're starting to have decent modern medicine and you can sort of have faith that the president probably will live throughout his term, but like a huge chunk of the 19th century, there's no vice president and they're kind of playing fast and loose with the succession lines. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting that the absence of, of anybody there and the presence of someone there doesn't even catch our attention. <laughs> no, it doesn't. And I also, I mean, if you also look at the list of vice presidents, the number of names that you've probably never heard of totally, I mean, speaks to your point. Um, so there, there absolutely were political celebrities. It, there, were, there, were, there was a concept of celebrity. Of course, their, their mechanisms for discussing this were a little bit less instant without the telegraph and newspapers did take longer to be sort of transmitted and printed. There's no photography, things like that. There's no social media. So it certainly looked different, but there were people who were celebrities. I mean, Dolly Madison is a great example. She was absolutely a political celebrity and was, was celebrated. And a lot of the first ladies were covered in the sort of detail we would expect 
um, celebrity to be covered. So Mary Lincoln was constantly in the papers for good or for ill, depending on uh, what people were talking about. Um, when Grover Cleveland married his wife, who was also his ward and who was uh, quite young, that was a very big celebrity to do. Everyone was trying to get pictures of them on their honeymoon, and then once they had children, everyone wanted pictures of their children. But to your point, it really doesn't extend to the second family until the 20th century, and I think that's just because, well, if I had to speculate, I would say that often the second families didn't come to DC, so they were home, so there wasn't the same sort of access from regular journalists or newspapers to try and capture or discuss what they were up to. Interesting. Thank you. Kurt, what do you think? Well, you know, this, this notion of the cult of celebrity and kind of how it, and I, and I agree with you, I think this is more of a 20th century phenomenon as it, as it begins. Um, certainly there are political titans of the 19th century, but it, it's not the same, I don't think, and, it's, and it certainly doesn't extend to, to the second families. But I, I'm thinking again of, of the Trumans, and, and when, when Truman is drafted to become the vice president in the 1944 Democratic Convention, now nobody knew that he was going to be president within the year, but I mean, that, you know, the, I mean, they knew Roosevelt was sick, they knew that, you know, that they needed to get someone that they could feel good about in that way. But Margaret and Bess are at the convention, and there's this sort of, all of a sudden this, this announcement is made and Harry's like, there's this throng of you know, reporters and people and they're pushing and, and, and Bess, and there's like this sea of people and Bess and Harry are kind of pushed further apart. And at one point she looks at him and said, is this what you wanted? You know, and she's just incensed by the fact that now suddenly their, their privacy, their lives, everything is going to be different going forward. And she had a sense of that. Even as first lady, she spent a lot of time in independence. She didn't care for, and she was mortified at having to follow Eleanor Roosevelt in that role, obviously, because of, of, of the celebrity status that she had as a daily columnist and that kind of thing. But I would also say it extended to Margaret Truman, their only daughter, because Margaret became a kind of, and I would, I don't know, maybe one of you can correct me on this or, 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 or cite a better example, but I think she's one of the first who sort of leverages that celebrity role a little bit. Margaret used to show up on I guess game shows is what we would call it, you know, where they would have celebrity guests come on and, and clown around with people who are, you know, answering questions or doing, you know, silly things. I mean, it's, it's funny, you can YouTube this and go look at some of those clips and it's, it's, it's painfully awkward to see how they, the jest and the back and forth. I mean, it's, it's, it's very corny by our, any kind of standard. It wouldn't qualify as humor or anything today. But Margaret was very much in that role she wrote mystery novels. Uh, she had a, a bit of a singing career. Uh, funny story about that, how she got panned by a Washington Post columnist and Harry wrote probably one of the most um, um, unfortunate letters of his career where he sort of threatens the guy, you know, I hope I never run into you because you're gonna, you know, have a black eye and sundry other things. But, but I think that, um, that th this is sort of the beginning of of families feeling like they're in the spotlight in a way that maybe they just weren't before. Um, you know, again, we've known about the first ladies, we've known about families, but I think that starting, you know, and then you think about what the Kennedys do to that whole notion of celebrity. I mean, I think that's a huge thing as well. You know, it would be interesting if we could talk to, you know, Lucy and Linda Johnson and sort of think about their experience as being vice presidential children versus being presidential children, because they were still relatively young. I mean, they weren't kids home at school when their father became president, but they were young enough to sort of be in, in the spotlight. And their, their marriages and their children and their starting their families, all of that was sort of in the papers and in, in the press in a way that, you know, decades before that would not have been the case. And again, you know, another very interesting example of this is um, Susan Ford. You know, she is a teenager, still in high school, when her father becomes vice president. And she spends her, her senior year of high school and her freshman year of college as the first daughter. You know, he's president though, during, during that critical time of her, of her life. And so there are people who sort of made that transition. And I'm sure that they would tell you that the spotlight was way more intense being a presidential child versus being a vice presidential. Well, a great, uh, great um, comparison to that would also be Bush 41's children, 
Mm -hmm. um, I, I went back and I looked, I was sort of looking to see what his sons had done while he was vice president, because I know, of course, they obtained their, or they won their own political positions, but a lot of that started later. And so I was, I was curious, and the fact that I didn't know actually kind of mm -hmm. speaks, speaks mm -hmm. to this question of they had their own businesses and they were, you know, had their families and they were living in Florida and Texas, but I don't know that anyone really covered Correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if anyone really covered their business activities as second children. It wasn't until they were the children of a president that I think they became interesting to the public. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that your sense as well? I, th I think so, and I think that, again, I just think the general question of presidential children, I mean, people are far more interested, far more critical of, you know, say the Trump kids or Hunter Biden and, and any business dealings or whatever their role, role might have been or how they tried to leverage the, 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 the celebrity, you know, try to leverage the access. Um, I mean, obviously that's always gone on, but, but I think that, um, I, I think we just ask different questions. We're concerned about different things, you know, in the media and other places, so. It's interesting to think about both the media and the public and their relationship with the, the vice presidential families. And in terms of like, Vice presidential family, second ladies uh, and, and second gentlemen um, and their children, uh, they have their own lives and personalities and they must have a struggle for authenticity versus maintaining or meeting public expectations. Mm -hmm. But that of course begs the question, what does the American public expect of vice presidential families? You know, what, what is, Obviously, it's not written in the Constitution, but, but certainly like the American public must have a, uh, uh, an idealized role for what vice presidential families ought to do or ought to be. And what is that? What do, you, what do you think that the American people want from vice presidential families or don't want? Well, I think this question is in a lot of ways very colored by the fact that until now, we've been talking really about second ladies um, as opposed to second spouses. This is the first time we've had to mm. discuss a second gentleman. And for at least until quite recently, it was expected that the spouses of both the president and the vice president were going to be helpmates. They were going to be hostesses. They were going to do the social and diplomatic um, expect, you know, roles. They were going to be expected to participate in that. They were it was also encouraged and expected them to sort of take on their own causes, but generally within what one would consider to be the bounds of the domestic sphere or fem what was appropriate femininity. So, um, you know, one of the one of the first women to actually really uh, partake in this was, you know, Mary Lincoln went and she. Um, gave her time and she volunteered efforts at a local military hospital. So nursing was an acceptable activity. Working with an orphanage was an acceptable activity. Today, a lot of first ladies and second ladies will work on um, you know, reading or schools or um, some sort of family-centered activity. And Barbara Bush is a great example of this. She started her literacy work and her campaigns as second lady, and then of course continued them as first lady, but was very careful when she was second lady not to take any official positions in that capacity because she worried that it might overshadow Nancy and they already had a very bad relationship and so she didn't really want to make it worse. Um, so I think that there, there is an expectation that women would partake of supporting activities and appropriate public activities, but within this defined sphere. I don't, I think the public would have really raised an eyebrow if, for example, a first lady really wanted to participate in military affairs. Now not, it's totally acceptable to support military spouses and children and families, but like hardcore military affairs would probably raise an eyebrow. Mm. Yeah. And it's interesting that involvement of of a spouse or a child in, or, or being perceived as being involved in policy. Uh, remember the controversy when Hillary Clinton as first lady was going to take over the sort of health care initiative and kind of try and move something forward on that. I mean, it did not go over well. And Rosalind Carter used to go to cabinet meetings and sat there and take notes and she was very much an advisor to her husband. People looked at her like, what's she doing here? Why, why would we, I mean, is, so I think that there's, there is a kind of uh, discomfort with some of that but I also think what's interesting to me is we talk about their, their role in policy or, or politics, 
But it really, I think it's, it still comes down to, it's very partisan. It comes down to what is the role vis-a-vis -vis the party. So Barbara Bush is a great example, again, of even as second lady and as first lady, you know, her attitude, for example, about um, abortion rights was very different than what the Republican Party at the time was espousing. And so she had to basically just kind of go quiet. She would not speak to that issue. She, was, she tried to avoid, I mean, it was people kind of knew and it was kind of talked about a little bit, but it was, it was the kind of thing where she just wasn't able to kind of come out and sort of offer her um, opinion. Be, and not because there, were, there, were, there was plenty of acceptance of her position politically in the broad spectrum, but within her party, within her husband's party, it was not acceptable. And I think about the same, the same is true um, with vice presidential children. I'm thinking, for example, of Vice President Cheney's daughter and her orientation becoming an issue during the debate, one of the debates. And you know, Mr. Cheney was incensed by that, and I, I think rightly so, that, that why should her life why should her choice, why should her decision and how she chooses to live her life, why should that be a political issue? Well, only because the party was coming out pretty hard against some of the um, you know, equality and, and some of the things that were, being, that were being discussed at the time. And so somehow this was an anomaly, somehow this stuck out in the middle of this party. It didn't stick out politically, it didn't stick out culturally, but it stuck out in a partisan way. And so I think that where, where vice presidents and vice presidential families um, have to be um, maybe more careful is when they run afoul of the partisan uh, prevailing currents as opposed to the general political trends. You know, your comments really bring to mind there's this a series of amazing quotes that occur during John Adams' presidency where Abigail Adams was sort of accused of being his cabinet of one, which was absolutely accurate, by the way. She was far and away his most important advisor. And sometimes people really liked that and wanted to use that to their advantage. So when John took positions that were maybe unpopular in his party, people would say, oh, if the old lady was there, then he would have done the right thing um, because she was back in Massachusetts. But other times, for example, when she was supportive of his particular actions, and he was at odds with his party, then she would be accused of being as political as the great French ladies, which was supposed to be a real, you know, smackdown for her because there were all of these women in France that hosted these incredible salons that were these political conversations and they were super involved in politics and policy and, and theology and, and it was considered to be sort of unfeminine. And so she was accused of being as political of the, as the French ladies, which well, I think shows both you know, how far we've come and also how not far at all. Well, there are also other kinds of French ladies who were accused of having great influence in the court as well. And so it's, it, it's definitely not a compliment. <laughs> no, it is not in any way. <laughs> Well, we're moving now from you know, the existence of political celebrity and its impact on vice presidential families as people to how influential vice presidential families have helped to shape not just elections, but also politics in America and, and administrative policy. And this is an underappreciated aspect of the vice presidency in general, but also their families. Uh, so it's important to think about how prominent vice presidential families can help shape public perceptions and political narratives. For a long time in the United States history, vice presidents were, were selected as running mates you know, for their ability to bring in a certain uh, voting demographic, you know, the Southern vote, you know, the, the, the Western vote, that kind of thing. But again, in the 20th century, alongside the rise of political celebrity, there's a personalization of the office, and beyond you know, regional politics, there's a larger American narrative to be constructed. And vice presidential families would end up playing a role in that, and um, like a, a larger American narrative. And I'm thinking here of, a, for example, Spiro Agnew, whose family had immigrated to the United States. And, and uh, his presence on the ticket didn't just, you know, wasn't just supposed to help bring Maryland, but it also helped to weave a broader narrative about the American dream and, and the nation of immigrants and political success. So what about the evolving role of, of, of uh, second families as political co campaigns have modernized to become more focused on, on political narratives and relatability? 
Well, I, I think I was, as you were teeing that up, I was thinking about the two most recent administrations and thinking about, okay, what, why did Trump choose Pence, for example? And it was, he was very open about the fact that that evangelical vote, especially early on before he really had that securely, um, he, he wasn't, um, that wasn't him. And he knew that he needed to appeal to that group. And Mike Pence just fit that bill perfectly. So Pence comes in again, not to shore up. I mean, the fact that he's from Indiana, I think, is, is incidental. I think it's the fact that it's, he represents this uh, particular demographic within the base of the party. And now, I just saw an article either last night or the day before about um, the South Dakota governor, uh, Kristen Neem or Noam, yeah. Noam is, um, is someone that's kind of in, in the head of the Veep stakes is already sort of starting, you know, that who's going to be, who's, who's going to be the number two. And of course, here we, here we would see a kind of doubling down on, on, on the base vote as opposed to, you know, some, some, some people might say, well, I've already got this vote secured. I'm going to kind of moderate it with some other, but, but I think that his strategy is to, is to double down. And then you think about, I'm thinking about uh, the Biden administration. I mean, Kamala Harris. He was clear about the fact that he was going to select a woman of color. And so she brought, not California, Biden, I mean, a, a Democratic presidential candidate doesn't need to secure California, but, but needed to have that, um, that demographic and that base sort of shored up in that way. So I think that the, the sort of decisions that, that you can see being made, and I think it go, you, know, you can go back and talk about you know, the role of, of, uh, of the quails or the gores or whoever, you know, and sort of how, how and why these people are chosen. But um, I, I think it really does come down to what's going to help us most, you know, in terms of putting the best face on the party mm -hmm. for the general election. When I was thinking about your question, um, of course, the, this was an, an issue that Geraldine Ferraro brought up. Mm -hmm. She talked herself about how she was the daughter of immigrants and the daughter of an Italian immigrant and sort of the rags to riches story. But when you originally started sort of putting out these questions for us to think about, there were two instances that I couldn't help think about in terms of the shaping of the second family and in the political narr narrative. And the first was in 1791, uh, Thomas Paine published another, another pamphlet and it was much more controversial than common sense. And in it, uh, it, was, it included basically an endorsement from Thomas Jefferson, and the endorsement could really be read as a condemnation of John Adams and his supposed turn to monarchy. And at this point, John Adams is the vice president. And then all of a sudden, there was a series of essays published under the name Publicola that were attacking Jefferson, attacking Paine, defending Adams. And everyone thought that it was John Adams that had written these essays, and it was not. It was John Quincy Adams, who was in Boston, and he was working as a lawyer, and he wrote these essays basically defending his father, and people couldn't really tell who was the writing. So I think that's really fascinating, because it absolutely shaped the political dialogue for, for months, because everyone was trying to figure out who was saying what, and who was publishing what, and was, the, was Thomas Jefferson and the vice president feuding in the newspapers? So that was the first instance. The second instance occurred in 1829 when President Jackson was in office and he also had lost his spouse so he did not have a first lady. And so um, Fluoride Calhoun was the second lady and she was the second lady for both um, John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson which is a little bit of an interesting turn of events. Um, and she was very much sort of like one of the leading ladies of Washington, D.C. And at this point, again, those social circles that I was talking about are still very much in play. And she decided that she was not going to socialize with the wives, with the wife of one of the secretaries, Margaret Eaton. She was the wife of the Secretary of War. Because Fluoride felt that she was maybe a woman of ill repute. She had had relations with her husband before marriage, and that was unacceptable. And so she refused to call on Margaret Eaton, and it became this huge scandal in Washington, D.C. called the Petticoat Affair, where none of the other wives of the cabinet secretaries would socialize with Margaret, and Margaret complained. And so Jackson tried to tell the secretaries to make their wives behave, 
can guess how well that went. Um, and they all refused. They said, we are not telling our wives who to socialize with. And there was this huge cabinet divide. And Jackson ended up not speaking to most of his cabinet for a year. He did not speak with his department secretaries for a year, and then eventually found a way to get rid of all of them and bring in all new secretaries. So talk about a second family completely dominating political discourse and changing policies. I think that's one of the best examples. That is a good example, yeah. And now I'm thinking of other examples over time where, where vice presidential families have had impact on administrative policy, and then on the lived, you know, through administrative policy, the lived experience of, of Americans. And here I'm thinking particularly of, of Vice President Al Gore and, and Second Lady Tipper Gore, and how they together helped shape the, in the 1990s, helped shape the national conversation about, well, in the parlance of the time, family values and, and, and social issues. And for the younger members of our audience, let me just uh, uh, give you a little bit of context here. In the 90s, when you wanted to purchase new music, you had to go to this place called the mall. <laughs> in the mall, there was this thing called a record store. But it didn't sell records, it sold CDs. But because of uh, Alan Tipper Gore's campaign for family values, there were, in the 90s, there had to be explicit warning labels put on certain categories of music. And I remember my friends and I having a long conversation in a record store as we attempted to figure out what was the cool new thing to buy. We were talking about Tipper Gore and, and, and uh, her remarks you know, on, on, on national television and how that was you know, translating over into pop culture through these new admin administrative initiatives. Uh, anyway, my humble thoughts, but... But, uh, well, but think about how important that is, though, in the sense that, again, I go back to the parties own these different um, uh, bullet points, right? Family they own these values. different, the different. So family values was very much a Republican thing, right? It was a Dan, Dan Quayle had kind of taken on Murphy Brown, all that kind of stuff. So, so this is a, this is a Republican issue, but the Gores did something with with, with that initiative yeah. that the Clintons themselves could not have done. They could never have represented family values in the way the Republicans were talking about it, but the Gores could. And so they filled that role in a way. And I think, you know, it's really interesting to think about, like, who are these vice presidents that really change the nature of our, of, of our understanding of the office and the importance of the office? I mean, you go back and you think about Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson is known, what, as the majority leader. He is the majority leader. And he worked the Senate like no one has ever worked the Senate. And then you would think that becoming vice president, the president of the Senate, constitutionally, would be a promotion. I think it was a fish out of water. I mean, I don't think, I mean, it was, a, it was a step down for him, but they needed him on the ticket for various reasons. So he agreed to that. But it was, it was a lesser job than the job that he had. And then you fast forward to Gerald Ford and his important role as vice president and, and what that, you know, sort of, he sort of sets some of that in motion in terms of at least drawing our attention to the fact that you know, having someone with integrity in that office maybe, maybe really does matter. And so all of a sudden we're asking questions and looking at that differently. So I would argue that in the aftermath of, of Ford, there are three vice presidents. And you've already mentioned the Gores, but I would say the Mondales, the Cheneys, and the Gores are the three vice presidents in the three families that really change the nature of the vice president. I don't think any of those three guys were interested in being just, you go to the Senate once a week and do your ceremonial thing and there's a few funerals you can attend here and there and that'll be it. These guys were interested in policy. They were interested in making speeches. They were interested in being part of the team and part of the, part of the uh, administration in a way that previously um, they just weren't. I mean, I, you know, again, Harry Truman was only vice president for 82 days. But in that time, he only met privately with Roosevelt twice. And, and so you know, when Roosevelt dies, the Manhattan Project, all that has to be explained to Truman because he was not an insider. He was not, now again, it was a short amount of time, but, but that's different. That would have never, um, Al Gore, Dick Cheney, Walter Mondale, they would not have been caught off guard about anything that important in the administration. That would not have had to be explained to them because they would have been in those meetings. They would have been meeting with the president weekly. And so I think the role of these three families does change the nature of our, of our understanding, together with, you know, of course, the increased 
media attention, all of that, that that goes with it that wouldn't have been possible a generation before. Well, another example, I mean, to your point about, you know, the, sometimes the second family can fill in on the values checklist mm -hmm. that the first family doesn't necessarily right. provide. I think when, when the Bidens were in the second family position, you know, one of, one of the buckets that traditionally the Republican Party has claimed is um, pro-military, mm -hmm. strong, strong on the military. And especially a lot of uh, Republican presidents and, and you know, candidates have had military service. And of course, Obama did not have military service. But the Bidens, while Biden himself did not serve, of course, his son mm -hmm. um, was serving. And so they could really speak to military families. They could speak to the importance of the military. And I think that the, the family element there was really quite essential. Do you think that Joe Biden, you know, as vice president, do you think that personal tragedies in his family or his son Bo Biden's military service, did that lead to, as vice president, a particular influence on uh, the Obama administration's policy priorities? Did that translate, you know, from campaign politics and, and imagery to administrative policy? I don't know. That's a, that's a great question. I think that would require a little more thought in terms of, you know, what were some of the policy, you know, outputs and, and, and changes. Mm. I mean, certainly, I, I, because I think what you're talking about is like next level. You know, it's one thing to say, okay, we need this person on the ticket because they'll appeal to a certain demographic or a certain constituency that we're interested in. But then, do we turn around then and legislate or, or govern differently because of that? I mean, and I think... I, I think there are lots of cases in American history, just about every administration, where what we say we're going to do and what we end up doing or getting are not necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Um, that would be putting quite a burden on vice presidents and second families to say, you know, life is going to be different because this person is in. Now, what they do behind the scenes, you know, again, it's. Um, you hear all these stories, and I was intrigued by the photographers last night because you know they're they're witnesses to some of these things, and you you hear some of these stories come out through journalists and whatnot once in a while. But just the way Gore could kind of temper Clinton a little bit, and, you know, you, and, and it's just intriguing because it's not even so much from a policy standpoint as it is from a kind of personal and personality standpoint. Like, who's going to go to the president and pound the table and say, "Get with the program," you know? I mean, like, who who's going who has the guts to? I mean, who? I mean. Presidents are typically surrounded by sycophants, right? I mean, by, by yes men, by people who are going to tell them how great they are. Party donors. Yeah, absolutely. You, you buy your way in, access, whatever. And um, so for somebody to have the guts to stand up, and that's where I think some of the, the, the ones I've mentioned previously, you know, sort of changed the role because I think they were willing to say, no, I don't think we should do that. I think we should do something different. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the I think the best presidents know not to surround themselves with yes men, but that in some ways is a is a way that we can categorize them. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I'm, I don't know how much of an influence Biden had in terms of shaping Obama policy on the military. There there has been a fair amount of reporting, including in Obama's own book, that during the conversations about how to handle Afghanistan and Iraq. Biden was pretty adamant that the United States needed to get out of Iraq and was opposed mm -hmm. to some of the positions that were put forth and, and was the one banging on the table saying, like, is this actually a really a good idea? Um, and I think that those, clearly we know that, that Obama did not choose to get out of Afghanistan during you know, his administration. So maybe the ultimate end goal wasn't necessarily there, but certainly the, the person always pushing on that question, saying, is this a good idea, would have, I think, caused at least additional conversations about planning, about strategy, about you know, double checking all of the details. And then, of course, it did come to pass in Biden's own presidency. So once he was in office, he absolutely implemented that. Very interesting. Well, let's turn for a moment to the ways in which vice presidential families help to impact the social and cultural fabric of the United States more broadly. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, if we were to apply a, a not, necessarily, uh, not necessarily cynical, but perhaps an objective lens to this question, do you consider that the, that the inclusion of diverse second families in politics has helped to contribute to greater representation and inclusivity in America? Have second families 
truly been able to help broaden the political conversation? Have second families been helped to bridge uh, gaps between different demographic groups? Have second families truly been able to play a, a genuine role in fostering unity in America? Or, and again, this is the more cynical approach to this, and I'm interested in all views, right? Have second families been used more as political window dressing? Right? Is it a more hollow effort to wag the dog, as they say, by including more diverse uh, or, 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 or you know, more diverse people in the roles of, of second families? Is it a more hollow attempt to woo voters without necessarily any direct connection to, to the genuine social changes that are needed in America? How should we view this? Um, I think it's probably some of both. So our, our definition of diversity and who counts as a citizen has, of course, evolved dramatically in the last 250 years. It used to be that you had to be a white man of, of a certain amount of property ownership to cast a vote. And then it became you could be a white man. And then it became you had to be a certain type of white man. So, you know, at, there are those signs that was, you know, Irish need not apply. Or there was a lot of anti-Italian sentiment and, of anti course, anti-Semitism. Um, so, you know, I think we have seen I think we've seen great strides there in terms of who can participate in the process. Charles Curtis was Hoover's vice president. He was one eighth Native American, and he actually spent his first eight years on a plantation living with his Native family before he ended up going to move with his paternal grandfather. Now, interestingly, once he was vice president, he really pushed, well, first in the Senate, and then as vice president, he pushed for legislation that really undermined tribal sovereignty, and he encouraged Native nations to culturally assimilate. Um, so that was kind of a, a backlash in some ways to what we would think of as, as you know, diverse progress. I do think that there is a, a symbolic piece which is easy to discount as pure symbolism or sort of you know, phony metrics, but we know it as humans that we have trouble imagining and envisioning what we have not seen already. So it is very hard for us to picture a female president because we have not seen a female president. And we sort of wonder, well, like, is this the right person? And can they do the job? And will it be an issue? And those same arguments were made about you know, female secretaries of state. There was concern that they wouldn't be treated with respect in nations that they don't necessarily honor female citizenship. And we've seen that that, that, that fear actually wasn't all that warranted, and it's been just fine. Um, so we have to be able to see it in order to imagine it. And that is both true for voters, and it is also true for future generations. Little kids can only dream of growing up to be something that they think is within maybe the realm of possibility. And so that's where I do think that the second families, what we're starting to see now as second gentlemen and, and people of color are really important because it opens that as a possibility to more types of children. And even if that, that change hasn't necessarily occurred yet or we haven't seen the sort of substantive representation that we would maybe like to, I think it is a really important first step. I think those, those um, the change that you talk about though is it's very, very painfully slow mm. to happen. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we are, I mean, I don't know, I'd have to think this through more carefully, but I think with your question, I think I would say maybe we're still in the window dressing phase a little bit in the sense that we are, you think about, we're 250 years into this republic where, you know, how many years from the um, Reconstruction Amendments were, you know, almost a lifetime away from the Civil Rights Movement uh, for mo most Americans, you know, born in the post-Civil Rights Movement era. And yet we only very recently had our first African-American president. We only now, today, have our first uh, woman and first woman of color to be in the vice presidency. So these, these changes while, while the trajectory is very clear what direction it's going, the slope of the line is going in a certain direction, but it's not necessarily moving quickly. I, we just had a big conference on Truman's civil rights legacy, his, his decision to desegregate the armed forces and the federal workforce in 1948. It was the 75th anniversary this summer of that decision to desegregate. And I went to a panel that was put on by the Navy in Washington, and at that panel, 
I met the first black woman who was in the Naval Nuclear Program, the first black man who had served on a submarine. Okay, this, these, you know, and people in the military, by the way, you know, retire when they're like 40 something, you know, because of, because of the way the, the system works. So this, this relatively young woman, I mean, she was probably in her early 40s, and she was the first black woman in the Naval Nuclear Program. And she, and she had to fight her way in. She went and, and she said, you know, what, what, what is it? And she said, well, why, why would you want to do that? I mean, the, 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 the blatant kinds of, yes, yes, the, the system had removed the formal barriers from her participation. Just like we see now, there's, there's nothing that prevents a black man or woman from running for president or uh, a Hispanic woman from running for vice president or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. But the cultural barriers exist. I mean, they're very real. And I think what you describe, I mean, it's, 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 but it's, it's a work in progress. I mean, it's something that's going to take time. And as we see more of it and we, we take it um, you, you know, less for granted, I mean, we, we, we see it as normal, as routine, that's, that's what will happen. And I think the second families will just, by the flow of that sort of cultural trend, start to reflect that more and more. I don't know if we can say that they're agents of that change, because I think that's putting maybe too much on that, on that office or on those families. But I do think we will, we will see that trend continue, obviously. Yes. Well, it's interesting to kind of think of the, the, the historical significance of, of the most groundbreaking vice presidential families, uh, those that challenged gender and, and, and cultural norms. And does this push America in a particular direction, right? Or does it re reflect America? Uh, is it cause or consequence? Mm -hmm. And well, now I'm thinking of Geraldine Ferraro uh, when she became the, the, the first person who was nominated by a major party for, for the vice presidency on uh, uh, well, Walter Mondale's mm -hmm. ticket. Mm -hmm. And, and um, this was groundbreaking, right? Uh, the, the, the first woman to receive a, a major party's nomination for the vice presidency in 1980. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yeah, it's interesting. And I wanted to ask both of you, right, in terms of gender and politics, right? How was her candidacy received by the public and portrayed in the media? The Mondale campaign lost rather spectacularly in 1980. Mondale lost every state with the exception of his native Minnesota, right, in, in the votes coming out of the District of Columbia. It was humiliating, right? But the campaign stands out in our memories because of who the vice presidential candidate was, um, which is groundbreaking. And you'd like to see it, right, as, a, as an inflection point where American history is, right, started to become, where American politics, right, started to become more inclusive. And perhaps it did show people something they'd never seen before. And yet the public overwhelmingly rejected it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it, it brings up really interesting questions that we sort of don't realize are underlying assumptions about our political system. So it's not so much like, can, can a woman do the job? I think most people, at least today, I would hope would say yes. Um, but I think what her candidacy brought up, and I think we are starting to see this now in our political system a lot as well, is there were, there, were, there were implications that people hadn't thought through. So one of the big issues in that campaign was she released her, her tax returns, but should she have to release her husband's tax returns? They had filed separately for a long time. And that was a question that no one had ever really thought about all that much for two reasons. One, politics then, and I would say still now, is in a lot of ways a, a rich man's game. It's often, as we've discussed, expected that the spouse, at least until recently, wasn't necessarily working, especially if the spouse was a woman. They were probably expected to be home and, and raising the family and then maybe participating on the side or in the campaign. So they might not have had a whole lot to report on the tax returns anyway. Now, of course, he did have a lot to report. They were quite wealthy. They had done very well for themselves. Um, but it was hugely contentious. And initially, she wasn't going to. She said, you know, why should I have to? And under great public pressure, they ended up folding. But that question had never really come up before. And we've seen now, in the last couple of years, there was a lot of conversation about, would the second gentleman, what did he need to do for his work? How did that need to change? And of course, that had been a less of an issue with Jill Biden because she did retain her position as a teacher, but I don't think anyone saw her being a teacher as a potential ethics conflict. 
but there was all of a sudden a lot of concern about the fact that he was a very well-connected and, and I think high-powered and, and well-established lawyer. And would that pose challenges for the vice president? And so I think when we, it's not so much even the, when we see the new people in the positions, it's the implications that reveal our social and our cultural expectations about the spouses that are things we have to work through. And that's not just even the case for, you know, for second families. I think we see this a lot now. We've, we've been talking a lot about what are the obligations of spouses of Supreme Court justices? Do they have to stop working? Do they need to you know, do something else? And th this is, as women are working more and playing a larger role in the workplace, this is something we're gonna have to think through, is, is it fair to have those expectations? What should they be? Um, I don't have any good answers, and I'm not sure that any one person does. I do think it should be a community conversation, and we should sort of think through it, but I think the second families, as we see a, a change in the diversity, it's, it's those questions on steroids. You know, the interesting thing about the Ferraro um, uh, situation, too, is that, you know, when she was running on the ticket with Mondale in 84 against, um, well, it was Reagan was at the top, but obviously Bush is, is vice president. So her debate and everything is with him. And, of course, she really took it to him. I mean, she was not, not going to be pushed around. So in, in a sense, even though she wasn't successful uh, in terms of electoral success winning the election, she did sort of change the the cultural understanding that no no a woman can stand on a stage go toe to toe with a man and 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 hold her own and that may seem like well duh that's i mean that's an obvious like who would even think otherwise well in 1984 people did think otherwise but the other thing that's really interesting about that the wealth of the ferraros you know and they, they like what are their taxes how do they make their money well the bushes weren't exactly eke and buy i mean you know they and they were a fairly well to do <laughs> family as well and so that notion of like well but but they're sort of patrician, and you know their wealth has come over generations, and, and they're respectable, and all the, all those kinds of things. It's just interesting, and, and I mean I, I think the Bushes are above board. I'm not suggesting otherwise. I'm just saying that it's interesting that there's really no questions there. But like, who's this woman that's got all this money? Is it her husband's money and access to this? And how did she how did she get there? That that's there's there really was, and, and to some degree still is very much a double standard in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting to think of the symbolism of, of, of second families. And mm -hmm. uh, well, for the first time, we, we have a first, second gentleman mm -hmm. in, in America, right? And mm -hmm. Douglas Emhoff, the, 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 the spouse of Vice President Harris. And it's interesting to think about his career in, 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 in public engagement. Does this challenge traditional gender roles or, or, or re reflect? the current state of, of ideas of gender and family in America. And I like what Dr. Chavinsky said a moment ago about a, uh, engaging in a larger community conversation. And I'm sure many of you have your thoughts and questions that you'd like to explore on this as well. And so we will get to, to some Q&A here in a moment. Um, but yeah, yeah, and considering all the historical examples that's, that we've been discussing here of vice presidential families, Director Graham, Dr. Javinsky, um, what lessons can be drawn for future generations of, of, of leaders? Uh, what are the main takeaways uh, we, should, we should be thinking about after today's conversation? You know, how might the role and impact of vice presidential families continue to evolve uh, in the contemporary and, and in future political landscapes? Well, there always has to be a first somebody, right, a first something, somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I think, you know, as you've set this up and framed it very nicely, I think that the vice presidency and those vice presidential families are both a reflection of what we are as a nation. And I think we'll see more and more of the kind of diversity, that the rep more, more representation of what we are as a, as a very, you know, sort of pluralist, uh, sort of multicultural uh, society. So I think they're a reflection of that. But as, as they reflect that, they're also drivers of that kind of change. Because as, as, uh, as Lindsay said earlier, you can't, you, you, know, you, you, you have to almost see it to believe it. You know? And I think that once we experience different kinds of people occupying these roles, it becomes just immediately is normal. It's, it's acceptable. It's just, it's just the way it is. And so I think, 
I think presidents will continue to think carefully about how they select their vice president, which, which by the way, is it also an interesting point that we haven't covered. I'll just quickly say this. Today, we think of the person, man or woman, at the top of the ticket will make a personal choice about who they want to be their running mate. And they will choose someone that they get along with or that they perceive brings something to their, maybe fills a gap they don't, they don't have, whatever. But that hasn't always been the case. I mean, when, I mean, the parties made those decisions. You know, again, when Truman was selected to be the vice president, Roosevelt was perfectly indifferent. Yeah, I don't really know Truman, but it's fine. I mean, he really didn't have a sense that, oh no, Truman will bring this, that, or the other. It was the party that didn't want the current vice president, so they dumped him at the convention, and they drafted Truman. Truman, I mean, imagine this today. Truman went to the convention intending to nominate his friend and fellow senator, Jimmy Burns, as the next, for the office of the next vice president. And the party leaders wanted something different. Roosevelt wasn't even there. He was you know, having a dizzy spell in the, in the Ferdinand Magellan in, uh, in, San, in uh, San Diego. And he called in and said, you know, he, he sort of put the pressure on Truman to accept the job even. Mm -hmm. Truman didn't even want to be the vice president. I mean, that's how, <laughs> that's, again, he was just this ordinary senator from Missouri and he, he's, he's wanting to turn down the vice presidency, partly because he'd read enough history to know that those who came in, as he said, through the back door had not been treated very well by history. Everybody knew that Roosevelt wasn't gonna make it through another term. But, but I just think that's, that's sort of an interesting uh, sort of perspective is that, that we, we now would, would not, we don't care what the chairman of the Republican or Democratic Party thinks about who should be the next vice president. It's exclusively up to the person who got the most delegates and who's going to be the nominee to pick their running mate. One of the things I think our, our current second family does that's particularly interesting is it's not just that it's the first second gentleman. Mm -hmm. um, he is also um, very outspoken in his Jewish faith. Mm -hmm. And they are a both a blended race, but also a blended religious family. Um, she is a stepmom. These are all elements that we haven't seen a whole lot in our first and second families. And I think increasingly are reflected in how American families are today. A lot of American families are not necessarily the cookie cutter, you know, um, everyone, you know, one mom and one dad, and they're both the same religion, and they're both the same race. There's a lot of mix. I, they're very first, American. Yeah, family. it's a very, you know, sometimes there are grandparents, sometimes there are aunts and uncles, maybe, um, you know, and I, I think that that, um, the way that they are joyful in the sharing of both religions and their blended family is, I think, will both push and also reflects, to your point. Um, and I think that as we go forward, it is, it, I, I like to see people in office that aren't necessarily what we think of as like the perfect model. I think, mm -hmm. I think a little bit more colorful, a little bit messier is a little more interesting. Well, and they're a relatively recent family as well. Yes. I mean, this is not a, a marriage of mm -hmm. 30 or 40 years. I mean, they're of an age where, yeah. I mean, they're my age for crying out loud. I mean, <laughs> but but, the, but it's, it, it is interesting to see that they are you know, it's, it's not just they're a second family, they're, they're, they're on their second family. Yeah. You know, so it, it, well, and, it's Well, and to that point, because they, they are more recent, he, they met when she was already sort of the top of her game. Yeah, exactly. And so his joyful support for her professional success, to me personally, is a, is a delight to see mm -hmm. um, as someone who is pursuing a career. So I think that that is another more modern element that is, is good to put on display. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, too, because we often think of you know, had there been no Barbara Bush, there wouldn't have been a George Bush. You know, that, that, that she helped make him what he was from, from, from their teenage years forward. And, and you can say that of, of many, many of, 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 our, of our leaders in that way. So this is a, a new model in the sense that they, they were self-made before they even yeah. came together. That's a great point. Well, I want, before we get into Q&A with our, with our attendees today, I wanted to thank you both very much for what's been a very stimulating conversation. I think that by looking at vice presidential families, we've helped to explore many avenues of what is often an underappreciated office. But this conversation has also at least helped me uh, think about issues of American politics and their operation that I might not otherwise have.
And beyond that, I, I think this conversation has, has shown vice presidential families to be a lens through which we can hope to try to better understand who we are as a nation. And uh, you know, even the American family you know, can be explored through the lens of vice presidential family studies. So anyway, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. There's a microphone if anyone, we would love to take your questions. Uh, very interesting discussion. Um, without commenting on whether there's anything legal involved, <clears throat> with respect to uh, Hunter Biden as, a, as an adult mm -hmm. child of, mm -hmm. a, of, a, of, a, of a president or a vice president, do you think there should be ethical uh, limits mm -hmm. on uh, the participation of adult children in official um, uh, trips, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, not like, not like the Obama, <coughs> not like the Obama uh, girls when, when they were clearly, yeah. you know, underage. Sure. But if you have an adult, you know, it, it, does that, open the door for at least a perception of something inappropriate going on. It's a great question and I think a lot of the I think a lot of the well-intentioned discourse around this issue gets at the complicated questions at the heart of family and politics because um, to, to your point, uh, Hunter Biden was not an official in the White House um, while either while, while Joe Biden was vice president or president. Um, and, you know, and yet it, it's, it's very hard to draw family lines. So I, I don't know that anyone would be comfortable saying, you know, someone shouldn't pick up a phone call from their son, for example. That would be, a, I think, a very uncomfortable line for anyone to draw. Um, official trips are, I think, are an interesting question. I guess I just don't, I don't, um, I don't know exactly what, I, I'm sure that there could be ethical lines that could be clearly drawn that would make sense, like um, only, maybe only a certain number of family members could fly on Air Force Two, for example. Um, or uh, the Secret Service can't cover certain things, or you know, taxpayers shouldn't pay for certain things. Um, but I'm not sure that I would be, like let's say a, um, Hypothetically, a vice president was going to to Paris, and they're flying on Air Force Two, and there's an empty seat. Are, are we really okay saying like, as long as that like a child is not bumping someone important off? Are we really going to say like, no, a, you know, a child can't even if they're an adult child, they can't come with their parents? I don't know. I don't have a perfect answer to that question. Um, and I think that I think that that's something as a society we should discuss because there are these fuzzy lines between family and official members, and we want we want people to be close with their family members, right? But we also want to draw lines where there's not unofficial influence, and so I, I, th I think that that is is worthy of discussion. Um, and I think our ethics rules across the board and across the entire system are, are due for a bit of an update. Um, and that might be a place where it's worth discussing it. And I think too that any any time your father or mother is the president or vice president of the United States, I mean you you sort of you, you can't separate yourself from that. So if you're in a business negotiation for, I mean you mentioned the the Bush sons when their when their father was vice president, even president, you know, had their business. Uh, dealings and their political dealings. I mean, as they began to get involved in politics, well, was it an advantage to be George H. W. Bush's son in trying to cement a deal, you know, to buy a baseball team or to run for governor or to do whatever? Well, how could there not be? But that doesn't mean that anybody did anything unethical or illegal. The same, you know, the 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 Trump uh, children continued to buy and sell properties and do all kinds of business dealings around the world. And of course, they had Secret Service protection and they have this entourage that goes with them. Well, does that make an impression on a potential business partner? Well, I can't help but think that it doesn't. But at the same time, I wouldn't want to deny the president's children Secret Service protection to save a buck. You know, I mean, do we really want to get to the point where, 
I, I mean, these people didn't run for office. They didn't ask for this. And so the fact that they you know, would have protection, the fact that they remain close to their families, the fact that there are certain perks that come, I mean, every senator's children, you know, they, they all work as, you know, lobbyists mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, is it an advantage to be Senator so-and-so's son or daughter in your career? I, I can't help but think that maybe it would be helpful. But that doesn't mean they're breaking the law. That means, I mean, there, and there are ethics laws and those things have to be careful. I think, and, and, and are there for a reason, but I think that when we focus on someone's children, and, and this happens across the party spectrum, this happens across administrations, I think, I think that is, um, I think that's really unfair. In fact, I, just one quick example on that. I remember when somebody, some comedian or somebody at some point took a cheap shot at, um, at Baron Trump, the president at the time, president's teenage son, and it was Chelsea Clinton and the Bush girls and others who, who jumped to the defense and said, "Leave him alone. He didn't. He didn't ask to live in the White House. I mean, he's a kid, and he, you know." And so I think that I think in some ways, families have always been kind of considered off limits. I think that changed. And I used the example earlier with with Mary Cheney. I think when, when her life suddenly became something that was okay to talk about politically, and I, 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 I don't think it is okay. I, I think that there really should be a line that these people should get to live their lives, and as long as they're not breaking laws or, or violating ethical standards, that, um, and if they are, then that should be taken care of separate from the fact that it's a political problem or headache for their, for their father or mother. It's interesting to think, you know, about, you know, how the children have been treated mm -hmm. for a long time as off limits, but then yeah. mm -hmm. I'm thinking now of Sarah Palin, yeah. you know, as, as a, a vice presidential nominee. And uh, part of the reason that made her stand out as a candidate was her family. Right. You know, her, 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 her children's military service, right? Her, her teenage daughter's decision to bear a child rather than abort it. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of these things were, were emphasized during her the special campaign. needs child. All yes, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and uh, so rather than keep those family members off limits, they were sort of, they became part of the campaign narrative uh, symbolically. Well, political handlers want it both ways, right? I mean, yes. they want it. They want it. look, look. Let's celebrate this, but leave us alone don't because you don't know. Yeah. 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 Ooh. Um, my question has to do with the post presidency. Are there any official or unofficial things that we do for the vice presidents? We know that they get Secret Service protection for six months, but then we just expect them to to go away. I mean, you know, Dan Quayle was only in his early fifties, mm -hmm. and a lot of these guys, you know, still. You know, Mike Pence had to do something for the last, mm -hmm. you know, few years. Do we have any plans for those? We know that presidents are sometimes folded into, um, you know, being delegations to funerals or things like that. But what happens to vice presidential families when it's bye? Mm -hmm. yeah. They they fly commercial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with without protection. Do, 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 I don't, I, so I don't actually know the answer. Do vice presidents get pensions? I would, I would assume so. Oh, they, I, yeah, but. That would be my assumption. Yeah, but as, I mean, it would be based, I mean, vice presidential salary isn't, I mean, presidential and vice presidential salaries aren't that different yeah. than, no, it's than other. Office or something like that? No. 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 It's an interesting yeah. point as to their protection, though, and their families, yeah. given the way that vice presidents and vice presidential families are increasingly part of the American limelight and uh, become more politically uh, hot touchstones. Mm -hmm. Even after they leave office, right, they might want and or need continuing protection for longer than six months. So, I can yeah. see that changing for sure yeah. as, as we go forward, definitely. Thank you for that question. Stop well, that only changed for president, ex-presidents after the Kennedy assassination. Mm -hmm. It was Lyndon Johnson who insisted that former presidents would have um, secret service. Turned it down. Well, they initially, the Trumans wanted to turn it down because they didn't want that interference in their life anymore. But, um, but Johnson, as he was, was persuasive. And he told them that, <laughs> no, he said, we can't have anything happen to you and Harry, Bess, so you gotta, you gotta take this. And she, she agreed. And you know, there's a little house across the street. Bess lived 10 years beyond Harry. And that was the most boring Secret Service detail in the world. You sit across the street, you watch some little old lady, you know, come and go. 
as she did. I mean, nobody was out to get her or anything of the sort. But you know, they were. You know, you know I, I think we live in just a, such a crazy world. I mean, I, I, I certainly would be supportive of, of second families getting continued protection. But, but they do fall from the, from the limelight as well. I mean, former presidents are much more um, visible in the sense that they're out, usually they're out raising money for their foundations to build their libraries and do the kinds of kind of work that they want to do. Vice presidents don't necessarily, they usually give their papers, you know, that, I mean, sometimes they end up at their president's library, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they prefer not to have them there. But um, they, they usually have an institute or something back at their home state university, you know, their alma mater or something usually, and, and um, you know, they, they have that, and they work on other kind of charitable things that they're interested in. But, but usually there's nowhere to go. If you're, not gonna, if you're not in a position to be the next president, you know, I mean, John Quincy Adams is unique in that he went back mm -hmm. into the house, but I mean, there, there are, there are very few people who go from vice president to any other political or even, I mean, they speak and get paid and things like that. You know, they can make money that way, but, but it's, it is, they definitely retire. And you're right, some of these people are relatively young when that happens. Just a comment. Um, I just remember this impacted me personally, but in September of 1974, Happy Rockefeller announced that she had breast cancer. And that word had never been used, I don't think, in the public. I'd never heard that. Hmm. But then I think of all the women that I knew from that announcement. I mean, and she came out really publicly about her issue and what was going to be done about it. But how that impacted so many other women mm -hmm. that never even realized, you know, that this was a subject. And then I just look at that, how it impacted my own family. So I mm -hmm. just wanted to make that comment. Interesting. So I... I don't, admittedly, I'm not by training a 1970s historian, but I think it was Betty Ford, wasn't it? I think it was Betty Ford who was the first to do it. I think it was Betty Ford, because she, she... No, Betty Ford had the alcohol problem. Nope, Betty Ford had breast cancer. But he had breast cancer, but then just weeks later, happy around So I think it was the, it was, they were the, so, so the Ford experts <laughs> will tell us that they, so it turns out that they both had it around the same time. Betty Ford announced it and a couple weeks later, Happy did as well. And which was huge because to your point, it wasn't discussed. It was a woman's problem. You did not say the word breast publicly. And they both insisted that it would save lives if they did. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right about the impact and the, the change. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right about the impact, 100%. Well, in the same, you know, I remember um, Reagan had, I think, prostate surgery at some point mm. during, and, and it was, I mean, I remember, I, I mean, seeing like diagrams on the television about, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, I was, you know, I didn't know what a prostate was, and, and it was just interesting to think that there were people who were saying, uh, journalists saying, oh, my dad had that, and he, he went to a different community, a different town, to a different hospital to have the surgery because it was so embarrassing to even talk about something like that. So. It is interesting how our leaders in that way, you know, sort of show us that no, regular people have issues and, you know, medical concerns and other kinds of concerns and it's okay to take care of these things. But, and it does and it saves lives, right? Because nobody wants to talk about those things. Yeah. Nobody wants to go, you know, talk to their neighbors about, oh yes, well, those are just words that you're not used to, used to necessarily hearing. And, yeah. Very interesting. Even though they're not elected vice presidential family members do mm -hmm. have the, the capacity to change society to mm -hmm. even save lives in the yeah. case that, yeah. that, that, that was just pointed out? Uh, just real quick, we've got probably 50 things going on in Grand Rapids right now, and there's so many other people that would have loved to have heard your presentation. And I'm wondering if you, without a lot of extra work, could provide the questions that you asked the participants to answer that maybe we could give it to some of the high school teachers that we're trying to get them to teach more history and look at history through a different perspective because uh, you're all three just a wow factor. <laughs> and I also would wonder if maybe there could be something about how you became a historian. I just dropped off about 50 kids to the SATs or ACTs that are all looking at Ivy League and all sorts of schools. And I'm looking at you going, oh, I wish I could just bottle her and bring her over to the high schools <laughs> to talk to these women because we've lost that. They don't know what a historian is or why would I want to go to school to 
be what you become. So that's all I'm saying, just a commercial to see if we could get uh, some of your information to help to spread your news, okay? Yeah, absolutely, and I know that this is also gonna be on the YouTube page, um, and on the museum's YouTube page, is that right? Yes, so uh, the, uh, the entire uh, audio and video recording of this is, is being conducted um, by some real specialists in the back, uh, and it will be um, on the uh, our uh, Gerald R. Ford Library as well as the foundation's uh, YouTube uh, pages. Uh, they, it will probably be up about a week after this event. Uh, take some time for editing and all that kind of thing, uh, but it will definitely be up, and it will be up uh, as we love to say within the National Archives for the lifetime of the Republic. <laughs> It's frightening. Yes, it is. Um, I'm a Michigan music grad, and I taught on Camp Pendleton for 21 years. And um, the conversation today I found interesting. But having taught on a military base, um, I didn't. The only comment I ever heard by a teacher in um, between. Camp Pendleton and then um, being organist in Naval Air Station, North Island's Chapel, was when a teacher said in the teacher's lounge one day, well, I don't want Michael to grow up to be a drunk on the reservation. Hmm. And um, this is a black and white conversation, and I understand that. I was raised here in Michigan. But um, I'm very close to this now, the whole family now. This young man who this comment was made about, about is now driving big rigs all over Texas. <laughs> mm -hmm. And his older brother, who I also taught, is on the Navajo Reservation in a school district in Arizona as an administrator. And um, there's another world that we don't discuss. And it's what we did to the people, the first peoples here. I didn't know until just a couple years ago that Abraham Lincoln had allowed the largest mass execution and it was of Native people, I think 39. So um, we have a lot, just black and white isn't everything. We have a lot as a species that we're all humans. Thank you. I'm gonna say something about Noam. To me, history is uh, a lot of stories. Uh, and looking at uh, post, uh, vice presidential lifestyles. This is kind of a three-parter here. Successes of those who were uh, vice president and then they went on to successful uh, careers or something afterwards. Those who went on to less than successful careers post vice presidency. And then considering we're in the Ford Museum, curiously, whatever happened post resignation to Spiro Agnew? <laughs> I don't know about Agnew. I think we've got somebody uh, over here. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, the successes are generally the ones that then become president. Um, those are the ones we know about. Um, there, there was a huge portion of American history where life expectancies weren't that long. So as I was sort of going through the list of vice presidents just to make sure I hadn't missed anything, there were a lot of vice presidents who died within a couple of years of leaving office or a resignation. Um, and that was just because partly because we sort of have certain expectations about age of, of candidates and then life expectancy. Um, so there are a lot that kind of fade into Wikipedia entries um, or you know encyclopedia entries. Um, there are some that are cataclysmic failure stories. So Aaron Burr is a particularly uh, colorful one um, in that he served one term as Jefferson's vice president he might have had a better time of it if he had been more willing. So we touched briefly on this last night, but in the election of 1800, due to sort of a constitutional loophole, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr both tied in the Electoral College with 73 votes. And it was thrown to the House of Representatives per the terms of the Constitution, and it took 36 ballots to determine that Thomas Jefferson would be the next president. Partly because the Federalists really didn't want Jefferson to be the next president and they still controlled a large portion of Congress and were trying to push Burr in in his place. There was a lot of um, machinations behind the scenes. And partly because Burr thought, no, that might not be such a bad idea. And he was kind of encouraging some of these plans uh, from the wings. 
um, which of course broke his trust with Jefferson. And so after the first term, he was sort of unceremoniously booted out and then may have gone on to commit treason. It's kind of fuzzy. Uh, he, the, the case was brought to court. It was, he eventually was acquitted, um, but may have been trying to kind of start an uprising in the Western territories. The evidence is a little fuzzy. Um, so that's probably, and then of course killed Alexander Hamilton. So that's probably among the worst stories. Uh, wasn't Spiro Agnew convicted of crimes? Well, I think wasn't so. Spiro yeah. Agnew convicted of crimes? I think that he pled to a lesser penalty. Okay, <laughs> is the way I understood. It. Well, the issue was that he was guilty of taking bribes, you know, through contractor Pretty kickbacks blatant. while he was governor of Maryland, and, and the evidence. Historically, is overwhelming. Yeah. yeah, he was like handing over like envelopes of cash. Yeah, to the vice yeah, president's office. Uh, this is what caused the end of his political career, and and uh, his place in American history has subsequently always been ignominious. But I think in the modern era, though, just one final thought about that: about you know, how do you define success? I mean, like you say, being becoming president after being vice president is probably what we would mostly say. Oh, that there's a successful vice president, but. Um, you know, I think of some of the advocacy work that Al Gore has done. I think of what Walter Mondale did at the University of Minnesota, you know, and mm -hmm. becoming involved in the education of the next generation. Uh, you know, Vice President Cheney uh, gave up probably somewhere between 30 to $50 million worth of personal wealth by leaving Halliburton and, and coming in to serve as vice president. So um, what, what is success then for someone who's, I mean, there is a sacrifice involved for all of these people, whether you, mm -hmm agree with them or like them or whatever or not, they gave up something to be able to serve in that role. And so I think that is a measure of success all by itself. Uh, there, there's a kind of patriotism about that. There's a kind of uh, selflessness and a kind of, of service ethic that is involved in, in being willing to, to uh, devote your time and your career to public service. Um, but I think that they continue to be involved in you know, whether it's party things or university things or whatever, I mean, I think they, they, they sort of, I don't know if they fall into the pages of Wikipedia only, but I think they fall into, um, you know, they become educators. I mean, they become people who lived a certain time of history and they become windows into that history for us. In some ways, even more interestingly than the, than the presidents because the presidents are so caught up, I think the vice presidents are, are almost better witnesses of that history. And so I, I think, I would love to see an explosion of biographies and, and uh, uh, scholarship done around what these, um, not just their own memoirs, but what these vice presidents lived and what they saw. Well, thank you everyone for, this, uh, for participating in Q&A. Thank you to our panel, this was amazing. Um, I just wanna say that Dr. Chavinsky has a couple of books for sale in our bookstore here, and she is gonna be available for signings. Uh, if you'd like to do that. And then we are gonna take a break at this point. Uh, we will be back at 12.30, is that right? Yep, okay, so we'll be back at 12.30 with our next panel. So we hope you'll join us again. Thank you.